Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson three of the so-called Chibi Fighter assembly program tutorials. Now, today we're going to be looking at my little test game again. We're going to be looking at the main loop code. Now, this is the code that handles the main gameplay. If we just start the game up here, um, so this is the part that we will see just now when the players are actually moving around. If I use the right controls, so this is the Sega Master System version here, and um, basically, it's the the core code that is handling the main sequence of events that are required to keep repeatedly happening during gameplay and we're looking at the very top level at the moment and we'll look at the subroutines in later episodes now the important thing with the chibi fighter game is that basically everything except for the graphic routine and the joystick reading routine uh, and the um, the core sound driver the chibi sound pro sound driver are uh, multi-platform so only those are the, those are the only platform specific modules so there's very little to convert when porting this to new systems so the entire main game loop is multi-platform code which as i say if you're going to try and port a game to lots of systems is really what you want to endeavor to do if if you can so let's go over to the code today and let's see what we've actually got so here is the game core which is multi-platform code and we're going to be looking at the main loop and this will just infinitely loop around until a the level ends because a player has won or the time has run out so the first thing we're updating here is a byte called timer ticks occurred here now this is a value that gets, just goes up from 0 to 255 and then keeps wrapping around now this is used for the animation control now the, the gameplay you will have characters doing animations like jumping or punching or throwing fireballs and things and there is a scripted animation engine that does this um, it was ported from the chibi akamas game actually i rewrote it for this taking some of the ideas from it um, and this it uses a, um, a a numbered value that just keep, keeps rotating around and it's used to control the different speeds of different things because a certain animation might be very fast and another might be very slow so that, that's why this is going up just indefinitely it's not relating to the um the countdown of the level time but it, it is used for other things. Now then what we're doing is we're running the platform specific read joystick routine and then we're loading the value of the joystick bits into the D register here. Now the read joystick routine will re return bits marking up, down, left, right, fires one, two, three, and four if they exist. So this is in a common format. And as I say, that's platform specific code that's doing that. It's the one I used from the simple series basically. Okay, so we, we're loading in the joystick input into D here, and we're loading IX with a pointer to the player's sprite data. Now, the sprite data is actually other things, as such as the life and the current animation and things. And we're running this update fighter routine, which handles all of the um, logical updates for the player's position and things like that. So if the player's trying to walk right, can they walk right? Are they being hit? Have they been hit? Are they injured? That kind of thing. All of that's being handled by the update fighter routine there. Now, what we're then doing is we're running the animate sprite routine for the sub sprite. Now, the sub sprites are the fireballs. Basically, the players have fireball attacks, and these are a simpler sprite object which has the animation engine code, but it doesn't have the same AI code that the player might have. Now, we are doing the human player here, which is why we're loading in the input from the joystick, but we also have an AI player, a CPU player. We are loading in the pointer to the sprite CPU object here into IX, and we're then running this read AI routine. Now this is effectively a virtual joystick. It's um, using some crude AI to decide what the computer wants to do, but it's returning its values in the same up, down, left, right function. And the reason I've done this is um, we can then just run this routine, the same update fighter routine with this virtual joystick input and the CPU will control the player. But there's no reason we couldn't have both players human controlled or both players CPU controlled. So by making the AI actually simulate a joystick, we can use this exact same routine and potentially use the same code for a two player human versus human game. So we're doing that and then we're updating the animation of the fireball. Now we're gonna look at all of these subroutines in later lessons. Uh, for now, we're just looking at this very top level view here. Now, after we've done that, what we're gonna do next is we're going to update the um, BCD value for the time. Now the time goes from 60 down to zero and it's a binary coded decimal value. So first of all, of all, what we're doing here is we're checking if the value has reached zero, in which case the level has ended. If it hasn't though, we're updating this value called round time two and we're, we're subtracting six from this. And this is basically, um, it's like the top byte, if you will, of a 16-bit value of the current time. A single value wasn't wasn't fast enough to, to, to go down at the right speed. It would have gone down too quickly. So we've got a second value here, and we're 
basically subtracting that until it goes below zero. And when it wraps around below zero, we're then decreasing one from our BCD value and updating the drawn time here. So that's how we're controlling the speed. And if you wanted the timer to go down slower, you would change this from six to four. And if you wanted it to go faster, you might change it to 12 or something like that. So that's what we're doing there. So now we've updated our players and our um, time is, is required. We're now going to update the screen. Now the screen is using this um, this routine I'm calling Mintile, which is a virtual tile map. It's a software tile map on systems like the CPC, and it's a hardware tile map on systems like the Sega Master System that we're doing here. Now the sprites, if you will, are actually being drawn with a tile map in this case, which is why the mo movement's a bit jerky. But it's a lot simpler because we don't need to worry about how big our objects are if we were using hardware sprites. We'd be very limited to how big our, our graphical characters could be before we'd run out of hardware sprites on the screen. So um, it, it, it's a very simple graphics engine. It's only it's called Mintile because it's a minimal function. So we don't have any nice hardware sprites in this case. Anyway, first of all, we're running this repaint screen routine, which does the background tile map and the um, the scores and things at the top, which are also part of the tile map, the fonts are. And then we're running this draw play routine, and this is handling the virtual sprites. You remember we had these pointed to these virtual sprite objects up here. Um, these are actually still drawn onto the tile map again in this case, but they are handled as sprite objects, and the draw players will do that. Okay. So what we've done there is we've drawn our screen again. And what we need to do now is we need to actually handle the collision detection. Our players may be punching, there may be fireballs on the screen, and we need to see if those attacks have actually had any effect on the opponent. So we're going to run this routine here called player attacks IXIY. And what we're doing here is we are taking the pointer to the object that is um, committing the attack, if you will. IX is pointing to the sub sprite, the fireball, and IY is pointing to the player. So the C the question we're basically asking is, has the CPU's fireball done anything to the player? And that's what this routine is running here. And the partial one is for fireballs, and the main one is for actual, you know, player characters. And we're running these four times. So both we're we're testing the two fireballs first, and then we're testing the player sprites themselves. And we're also um, We've got this, um, if the carry is set, we're killing off the sub sprite because in that case, the fireball has, has successfully attacked and we need to remove it. But in these cases, we don't do that. But what we're doing is we're running this clear defense routine. Now the player objects have an attack value and if that's positive, then they are maybe making a punch or a kick. But if it's negative, they are blocking. And so we are clearing that block after we've processed the, um, the attempt of the attack so they, they would have to continuously block to actually effectively permanently block that's how we're doing things um, once we've done that we've actually completed the entire sequence and we're just jumping back to the top and we're just repeating until the level ends now the actual end of the round based on a, a victory blow if you will rather than a timeout this is actually done during the attacking routine and we'll see those in just a moment so here is the player attacks IXIY routine. Now the first thing we're doing here is we're checking if the life of the object is greater than zero. So we're checking if the player is basically still alive here. Now if the enemy player is dead, basically the IY, the one we're testing if the attack is hit, if that player's already run out of life, then the current attacking player has actually won. So we're jumping in that case to the winning situation. And that's why we're not doing this for the fireball because the fireballs, um, they, they work differently and they can have a life of zero. And if the life of the fireball is zero, it's effectively off the screen. That's why we're returning if the life is zero here. What we're doing next is we're checking the value of the attack and we're basically testing the top bit and seeing if the value is positive or negative. A positive value is a punch or a kick or a fireball. A negative is a block. So we don't want to um, we don't want to do any kind of attacking routines if the player is blocking. So that's why we're returning if the top bit is one here. What we're then doing is we're checking if the value is actually zero. And again, we're returning because in that case, there is no attack coming from the tested object. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to check the range of the attack and we're doing a range test on object IX and IY to see if the attack, a punch or a kick, is actually hitting the opponent. And if they are, we're going to actually deal with that blow, but otherwise the attack is effectively missed and we're going to skip down to here and clear the attack in that case because the attack has become invalid. The punch hasn't connected, so there's nothing to do.
Now, if the attack hasn't missed, what we're going to do is we're, we're effectively moving the attacker into HL here, and we're adding some score to the, the player here. So we're using the BCD add here to add one point of score to the player. We're updating the scores here. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to move the amount of the attack of the attacker into the amount of hurt, the amount of injury of the recipient of that attack. So if a punch had a value of five, then the and it connected the hurt of the recipient of that punch will now have a value of five. And this will reduce from their life bar over the next few ticks of the game. So that's that's what the hurt is a amount of life to, to be taken off over successive iterations of the main loop here. And so that's what we're doing. And then we're setting the carry here and we're returning to de denote that this has been this is connected. Now in this case we're clearing the carry by XORing A there and returning. And this is so that we can clear the fireballs when the carry is set to, to mark that the fireball has now hit its target there. So that's what we're doing there. Now, in the case that we need to clear the defense, basically all we're doing here is we are checking that the top bit of the attack is not zero. That it means it's a negative value, which is a defense. And in that case, we're reducing the defense over time. So the, the defense will gradually deplete. So that if we've got a high defense, it will last a few ticks, but um, it will eventually deplete. And then the final thing we're doing here is we've got the time over routines. Now, if the time has run out, basically what we need to do is we need to compare the remaining life of the two players and see which one is higher. And so what that's what we're doing here. We're comparing the byte value of the two players' lives. And we are going to basically make sure that IX has the pointer to the player that has now won. Now, these sprite player and sprite CPU, these are more than just the sprite data. They're also the name of the character, the life of the character, all this kind of thing, which is why that we can use these kind of offsets. And you will see when we have defined a winner, we will actually use that to show the player's name. Now, if no player has got a, uh, has got more life than the other, maybe no one hit anyone or they've got coincidentally the same life bar, we'll show the draw message here and uh, we will then continue and we'll keep continuing with rounds until one player actually gets a victory. Now, when a player gets a win, we're increasing the count of that player's wins here, and then we are showing that player's name to the screen, followed by the text message wins. So if Chibiko has won, it would say Chibiko wins, and if Yorita has won, it would say Yorita wins, or whatever the opponent is for that round. And we are adding one to the wins, and when the wins reach two, the, the game will end. It's sort of Street Fighter two rules there. So what we're doing here is we're redrawing the tar map so that the, that wins message is shown to the screen. We're waiting for a moment. And then what we're doing here is we're effectively doing a comparison to see if either of the two players has reached two wins yet. One win is not enough. That will instigate a second round. But when either player gets to two, the, the round has ended. So what we're basically doing here is seeing if this player has got two wins, it's time for them to fight a new opponent. If the um, computer has got two wins, then it, the player has, has lost. So it's time to go back to the title screen. If a player's only got one win or zero wins, if it was a draw, then basically we're going to repeat and have another round. And that's what we're doing there. Now, the final thing we've got here is the game over message. We're basically resetting the song. We're clearing the screen here. Blackout screen is clearing the screen, or clearing the tile map rather. And then we're showing the game over message, updating the tile map, waiting for the player to press, press fire. And then we're showing the title screen again. So there we go. So this is, as I say, this is the main loop and this is the game over um, instigators. And you'll see, and, and this is something I'd strongly recommend, is on the Z80, we are using these IX and IY with, with defined offsets. And these things like Sprite Life and Sprite Attack, these are just numbers like what, 0, 1, 4, 8. And these are pointers to the Sprite object, the offsets within the Sprite object that have useful data. Now, you will see... For example, here is one of the sprite objects, and we've got pointers to the uh, the miniature tile map that makes up the character, the bitmap data that makes up the character, the size of the character, the X and Y position. Uh, th these are the uh, the flipping options for the sprites and things. You got lots of different values here, and there's also things relating to the AI, the um, the actual score, the pointer to the keyboard buffer. These are all things you'll see later on. But we've basically defined a sequence of pointers to offset from that base sprite object. And this allows us to do um, basically tasks relating to the two objects so that we can use the same routine for the CPU and the human and the fireballs. These are four different objects with the same basic 
definition. And the other thing is, of course, is if we change the object definition, if we needed some more bytes for the score or something, and we had to remap all of these, we would just change this one set of parameters here, and that would um, update things all over the place. Now, this is quite a complex game, um, but if you want to see a simpler example of this, if you have a look at my um, YQuest game, I use the same concept of the IX and IY. If you want to see more content, then please consider buying my book, Learn Multi-Platform Assembly with Chibi Akimas. There are now two versions. The first one covers Z86502, 8086 and ARM. And the second one covers ARM Thumb, 65816, 6809, PDP11 and RISC-V. And I keep forgetting what the second one covers because it's new, but you can buy them both on Amazon. So if you want to support my content, please consider doing that. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.